Hi, I'm Peter Winkelstein, and I'm going to talk today about how we use data as a weapon in the COVID wars. Now, let's take a look at what we've seen in our community on the effect of COVID, or how COVID has affected our community. I'm going to draw a graph, and over here, I'm going to say, how many cases have we seen? I'm going to come back to to talk a little bit about how we define cases in a moment. And then down here, it's time. Starting, say, in March of this year, March of 2020. So what did we see in our community, which was similar to many other communities around the country? First, we saw a big increase in the number of cases, then a plateau, then a slow decline down to a relatively low level. And of course, the big question is, what's going to happen next? But we'll come back to that. First, I want to talk about data. What do I mean by number of cases? There's a number of different ways to define cases or to measure cases. The one you see most in the newspaper is the number of positive tests, number of positive PCR tests. That's the swab in the nose test. Uh, and that's fine if you've got enough testing to find everybody who's got COVID in the community. Now, back in March, we certainly did not have that kind of testing. We had no way of, re of measuring how many people had COVID-19 in the community. And even now, our testing is probably inadequate. We're not really capturing everybody. So looking at number of positive cases is helpful, but probably doesn't capture everybody who's got COVID-19 in the community. You can also look at fatalities. The problem with fatalities is, of course, you don't get that number until people have gone through the illness. And so that's a ways later. So it's a lagging indicator. And it also turns out that we're not that good at identifying deaths that are from COVID versus deaths that are from other potentially COVID related illnesses. And so we're probably under reporting fatalities from COVID, I'm sorry to say. So what we use and have used is we use the hospital census of patients who have COVID-19. How many patients with COVID-19 are in the hospital? And we do that for two reasons. One is we think we have a good handle on that number because we basically test everybody or almost everybody in the hospital. So we think we know who has COVID-19 in the hospitals. And secondly, our main goal is to try to avoid overwhelming the hospital system. We wanna make sure we don't have too many COVID patients that the hospitals can't take care of them because if that happens, bad things happen. The fatality rate gets higher. Uh, there's no hospital beds for people who have non-COVID related illnesses that need to go in the hospital. Uh, and basically the health system gets overwhelmed. That's what happened in Italy and in France. And we don't want that to happen here. So we use the COVID-19 hospital census as our measure of what's going on in the community. And that's what I mean here by number of cases. So this is what we saw in our community up, up through now. And so, of course, the question is, what comes later? So how do we understand this curve? How do we explain this curve? So in order to explain this curve, we have to talk about models. And we use, there are many models, we use a standard epidemiologic model called an SEIR model. An SEIR model is pretty simple. It basically means you've got people who are susceptible to the organism, in this case, COVID-19. Some of those people get exposed, that's the E. Some of those wind up becoming infected and infectious to other people, that's the I. And then they recover at some rate, that's the R, S-E-I-R. This model has many assumptions in it some of which are not all that good. It's a problem with this model. It's a very simple model. One of the assumptions, for example, is that the population is homogeneous. That means everybody mixes with everybody, clearly not realistic. But for large populations, this is probably an okay starting point, and it's a standard epidemiologic model. In order to use this model, you have to know a bunch of stuff about the virus and about the environment and about human behavior that basically tell you how often a susceptible person becomes exposed, becomes infectious, and how long it takes them to recover. Basically, you need to know a lot about these arrows. And as COVID is such a new virus, we don't have much experience with it in the early days, and even now, we didn't really know enough about this, about those arrows. And so we had to, we were learning as we went, and we were trying to estimate as best we could, and we used the data to help make those kinds of estimations. 
Now, another problem with this model that we discovered for COVID is that COVID's a little bit trickier as a virus than most viruses. It's a little bit more complicated uh, than most viruses that we've, that we've encountered. And so this turned out to not probably be a realistic view of what happens with COVID. In particular, this box, the I box, probably is not quite right. So what we did is we said, okay, we've got to be a little more sophisticated with COVID. We start with our susceptibles. Some of them become exposed. Now the I box gets confused. <clears throat> it turns out that everybody, as far as we know, who gets exposed and gets the virus goes through a pre-symptomatic phase, I'll call it PS here, where they are spreading the virus but don't feel sick. Some of them then go on to become symptomatic, they feel sick, but some of them never feel sick, they are asymptomatic. We think about two-thirds of patients become symptomatic and about one-third of patients remain asymptomatic for the entire course of COVID. And then we get back to the R box. So we had to take the I box and split it basically into these three boxes in order to have a more realistic model for COVID-19. This, by the way, is why COVID-19, these two boxes, the, the fact that we have to use these two boxes, these two boxes exist, is why COVID is dangerous. COVID is dangerous because you can spread it and not feel sick. Everybody does that for some period of time, and a bunch of people, probably about a third of people, do it for the entire course of the illness. This is what makes COVID dangerous. Now, in this model, one of the key parameters is what we call beta, and that describes how well the virus goes from person to person. So how often does a susceptible person become infected? Beta depends on a bunch of things. Partly depends on the virus, how infectious is the virus. It also partly depends on our behavior. In particular, it depends on how close we get to other people and how likely we are to spread it to other people. So if we're keeping our distance and we're wearing face masks, we don't spread it as well as if we're sitting in a small room with a large crowd and having a big conversation. So beta turns out to be one of the key parameters to this. And the question, one of the questions we're trying to answer is, what affects beta? And how does that then affect the curve? So now let's go back and say, what did we learn? Okay, so here's the curve of what we saw. What explains this? How, what parameters do we need to put into the model over time in order to say this, this is the curve that we would have that we got and we would have gotten with the model? So what it turns out is that this part of the curve, the early part of the curve, is pretty much exponential and matches what the model would say if a virus were spreading like wildfire throughout a community, which is basically what we had in the early days. But then this part of the curve, where we went from a plateau and now down to a low level, this part of the curve is largely explained if social distancing and face mask use work. If beta is reduced by social distancing and face masks, you get this shape of the curve. So that gives us confidence to be able to say that social distancing and face mask use are key to keeping the case count low. It allows us to focus our efforts on how do we best keep the case count low. And then that helps inform us about what's going to happen in the future. If we do a good job of social distancing and face mask use, we're gonna stay low. If we do a poor job of social distancing and face mask use, we're gonna go up. And in our community, we think that in order to keep the, the, the case count low, we need to be wearing at least half of us and really probably three quarters of us, if not all of us, need to be wearing face masks in order to keep this case count low. If we don't wear our face masks and we're not careful about social distancing, we're going to see this again. So this is how we use data. 
We use data to help us, and plus the models, to help us understand what happened. And that allows us then to focus our efforts on how to prevent a rise in cases in the future.